everyone, you are joining us here on a new episode of Melt. I'm Ritwika Gupta. Continuing our series of conversations with India's leading creative communications, marketing and production agencies, this week we'll be focusing on the evolving role of production companies in the advertising and entertainment industry. Today, Anand Rangaswamy, editor of Melt, will be in conversation with Rupak Saluja, the founder and CEO of Production House, Bang Bang Media Corp, as well as specialized and integrated agencies under the larger 120 Media Collective. Let's get ready to Melt with Rupak Saluja. Hello, Rupak. Hi, Anand. Good to talk to you. Ages. Ages. Ages since we've had a chat like this. So I wanted to start the conversation with almost the first reason that I had to talk to you, which was uh, Indigo's film, On Time is a Wonderful Thing. I remember very well, 2010. 2010, and it was a stunning film. One of and uh, it's a film that put Bang Bang on the map. That's right. So your business has changed dramatically from those days till today. You know, I remember 2012, 2013, you thought of, you know, starting a separate company for digital and so on, which you did eventually and so on. So tell me, in general, how production house business has changed? B, do you still call yourself a production house? It's definitely changed tremendously. I mean, it's one of the parts of the business that has uh, been impacted, um, I would say, by technology for sure. But other than that, there's a lot of other movement within the world of advertising. Um, I think chief among them being the integration of production into the agency setups, right? It was a given for a number of decades. It was always thought that if you wanted to do production, you need to go out. Suddenly around 2014, 15, you started seeing this change tremendously to the point that, you know, you had uh, companies, you know, all the, all the big agency holding networks like Publicis is Prodigious, WPP having a play, everyone sort of doing that in-house. So that's changed the business tremendously. And I'm thinking that this isn't new news anymore. And this is not just an Indian phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. In the major European market like France, in 2015, 70% of all advertising production was being in-house inside of agencies. So it's been a while now. In, and then there are entire companies that are founded on that principle. So Martin Sorrell's Next Innings, which is Media Monks or, or you know, whatever it's called right now. S4. But yeah, S4 and then Media Monks, which they kind of integrated into and bought over. So that's founded on the principle that production can be a part of the process and it's not to be separated. So what that leads to for production companies is that your last bastion of defense really only becomes your talent because no director worth their salt really wants to work at an agency. And that's still the case, thankfully, for production companies. And those who don't have that as a line of defense, perhaps, you know, competition swallows them up or evolution of the structures of industries follows them up. And perhaps, you know, it, you know, it's just part of the whole sort of disruption process. So I think that um, uh, in general, the for us as a company, you're right that the early days of, you know, I came in from not having grown up in this industry in India. I was at Ogilvy in Paris. And so uh, when I came in, I saw things from the outside. And for me, it was a clear opportunity to do things a little bit differently. A, to bring in international talent. B, to just operate with certain processes and transparency that perhaps the industry wasn't used to till then. For example, detailed itemized costings, which I believe we started in India, even directors' treatments was something that we, I don't know if we started it, but we definitely pushed that agenda. And by 2013, 2014, it became industry standard for everybody to be doing that. Because I remember in 2006, when we started, it was very normal to send a fax with one figure, 72 lakhs plus service tax. So those no changes, service tax then. Yeah, it was service tax then. Yeah, no, service tax started in 2005. Yeah. yeah. Those things worked well for us, but you're right. We were known as the, because we had all these international directors who were not eligible to do a lot of um, culturally relevant or culturally nuanced scripts. So we became the people you went to to make look good, basically, visual, right? So beauty, cars, etc. And that worked really well for us because beauty and cars, as we know, automotive and beauty have the largest budgets because the specialized production input that goes into it. Um, and then from there, we kind of, you know, things like Indigo's on time and then the IPL commercial from 2013, the Carnival one, which by many people's accounts is still, it's my number one piece of work that we've ever done still. And by many accounts is perhaps the, the most display of production prowess when it comes to an IPL production. So since then, you're right, we did also start a digital company, which then evolved into its own uh, entity which was Jack in the Box, which is 
one of the leading uh, digital agencies today. More recently, and we've been doing work along the way, you know, we've, uh, and then around 2015, 2016, we started also uh, doing a lot of work with Indian directors. We worked a lot with Dibakar Banerjee, and then we had some others who were sort of homegrown talent that came out of Bang Bang. And eventually, uh, around 2018, we had Ryan Mendonca, who was uh, a very um, reputed creative at Ogilvy and then went on to work at MTV, join us as a director. And he's had a flourishing career since. Uh, and so that's been one of our mainstays of consistent work and really visible work uh, up until today as well. So on one hand, we've got the kind of work that we do with Ryan. Then we have a few younger directors that we work with. And um, then more recently, we've also been working with directors like Rezi, who's known for his visual prowess, directors like Love Kala. And then uh, we have international directors whom we work with for various specialized things as well. So that's uh, where we are on the advertising front. More recently, as of a couple of years ago, my personal focus has been on the transformation of Bang Bang from being just a, a commercials production company or a pro provider of production services into building a global content studio between Bombay and LA. Uh, so that's what's kept it really exciting for us uh, because you have to keep evolving. And while advertising is still a very important part of our business, um, you know, this is a time where you need to look around and see what are the opportunities that are around us where you can deploy your skill sets, your network, your abilities. And we felt that actually, you know, it would be a completely missed opportunity if we didn't actually make a very serious play for the entertainment business, given the kind of focus and spend and proliferation of um, OTTs or streamers and the kind of content that budgets that they have. And so the way we look at it, the streaming was in progress and it really pays to be an arms dealer. So that's our entire sort of approach to it. So that's a, a different kind of risk appetite, no? In uh, when you do production, really there's, there's no risk. It's a it's it, a profit margin that you have. Yeah. Well, if you get into the entertainment business, development itself can cost quite a bit. Yes you and know? no. You're yeah. right. You're right. So development is the only risk. But the good thing is that unlike five years ago, it is possible to enter that business in a relatively lower risk manner. So as you increase your risk appetite, you can take bigger risks and obviously the reward follows. But I think, you know, you have to adopt a portfolio strategy where some projects you will take on with minimal risk and have the streamers actually buy and fund in advance. And then if you have the appetite to and the ability to, either with your own capital or capital that you raise from other sources, you're able to produce something 100% um, all on your own cost and then go and sell it. And obviously the margins there are then tremendous. Right. So do you think this is something every production house should do? Well, I don't know if every production house should do it, yeah. but I think that any production company has the capability of actually extending itself and pivoting to that. Um, and what's also interesting is, so there's that which is an absolutely, in a way, it's a different play in a different industry. But I'm also very interested in, um, I would say, the, the confluence of the two, right, which is branded entertainment. Uh, and if you have, because it's, it goes without saying, right? At the end of the day, if your audiences are going to gravitate towards media where, which is not being funded by advertising, uh, then how do advertisers actually reach them? And, you know, and this is something that's not new. We've been talking about as an industry, we've been talking about branded entertainment, branded content for about 15 years now. And 15 years, we've seen little or nothing. Absolutely. Right. In fact, the irony is, that the greatest piece of branded entertainment perhaps was something that took place right in the beginning, which were the BMW films back in 2007 or six. Yeah. yeah. So long ago. And ever since there hasn't been anything that has been at that scale and that level of quality. However, I think that it goes without saying that brands are going to have to make a much more serious effort. And I think the onus lies on perhaps not the streamers because they already, they're too busy trying to grow their subscrip subscription base, et cetera, et cetera. So perhaps the onus lies on people like us really to bridge that gap. All of us have been part of this conversation on branded entertainment for the last 15 years. Now the challenge always has been, what do you measure at the end of it? Now, for example, something as simple as, let's suppose these mugs were not white mugs and they were Pepsi mugs for the sake of argument, which is a simple placement, which is one low form of branded placement and so on. The trouble is, what do you measure and how do you measure? You know, in a commercial, it's very easy. It has the key message gone across and so on and so forth. And it was easy for CMOs who were funding the commercials 
to take a decision. But it's a struggle when they are asked to take a decision on branded entertainment. Absolutely. Because the metrics are hazy at best. So what do you measure? How do you measure? How does the CMO know he's getting bang for the buck? In fact, I remember having a conversation with you uh, in a less formal setting over a few drinks one day. And I think the conclusion we came to was that actually my grouse was that the metrics that were being applied were the same metrics that were being applied For to mass TV market TV. television, right. right? And it just doesn't make sense, especially if you are using branded entertainment as a vehicle to reach a more sort of an audience which cannot otherwise be targeted. And it's all about qualitative. It might be smaller, but it's all about qualitative and it's about the strength of that association with the brand relevance, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that we don't have the metrics in place and there has to be a complete relook at how one would approach that and it cannot be even the principles or the framework or the lens through which you look at it has to be different. It has to be really about the long term. It has to be not about have we moved the needle in sales from here to there. Yes, that's a best, best case scenario and it does happen at times. But those are sort of, you know, few and far between. It really, you know, just like sponsorship where people say that, you know, for to, in order to get the true benefit of any sponsorship program. You're two and a half X of other investors. Yeah, and also you have to look at, you can't look at it in year one, two, maybe three. But, you know, I mean, uh, in the same way, this has to be something that's sustained over at least five years kind of thing. To Or, or you're measuring perhaps just perception shift or awareness. Okay, so take... Take, you know, there are there are some brands that lend themselves more easily. Um, let's say you were to take Enfield and given the kind of cult status that it has, I think it shouldn't be too difficult. And I think they have had a couple of successful attempts, but I think that there's more that they can do to actually create content which would be compelling for the world to watch. I mean, you watch Drive to Survive on Netflix and look at the manner and you take Formula One as a brand in this case, right? Look at the manner in which they have shifted perception shifted, I mean, just awareness in general. People, I mean, even in India, you know, and I was likening this to how Queen's Gambit, in the month after Queen's Gambit came out on Netflix, uh, traffic on chess.com went up 9x, right? So I was trying to see if there was a parallel to that uh, with Drive to Survive. And I can't remember, I think there was a 53% uptick in Formula One viewership um, for through Drive to Survive, which was attributed to that, right? Or at least it was right after that. So in the same way, there are things that can happen. So it all depends on what you're, you have to be clear, like in anything, you know, you have to be clear about your objectives and it won't work for everything. But eventually, if you're going to be in a situation where any audience that you want to target is not going to be on ad funded media, how the hell are you going to reach them in the first place? Okay, now here's the provocation. In the last seven, eight conversations I've had with people in uh, media, not, not on the production side. CMO's focus seems to be shifting to bottom of the funnel on performance and not little or nothing at the top of the funnel, which is building, building your brand awareness and so on and so forth. While entire uh, area of uh, branded content is top of the funnel, it cannot by definition be at the bottom of the funnel. Right. So how do you deal with that? I mean, where's the resistance there? If the bottom of the funnel is working for you, eventually there's going to be, it's, it's a matter of choice. They have the choice and also it depends on how these CMOs are incentivized. You know, if you're at a company like a Unilever where you're going to move on to another role in two years or et cetera, et cetera, and your people, you know, you're, are you incentivized for long-term performance? Are you a CEO of a, whatever sized company who ha is in incentivized on say five years or is it a two year pr program, right? So if it's, if you're incentivized on two years, then you're going to be incentivized to go for the short term solution. If however, you're looking at tenure, health of the brand, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't know how to do that. So I think it's really going to be about lack of choice that will drive them there. As long as you have the choice and if you are incentivized to drive short term performance, then you're going to go for the short term. Okay. Now, the other thing you see the biggest Spenders, I mean, we just uh, went through the pitch Madison report where you look at the top spenders on ADEX. You've got, I think, 10 out of the top 50 are new companies which were not there before. Right. All uh, funded companies, unicorns and so on and so forth. And none of them remotely is interested in the long term. They want sales yesterday, not even today. Right. So uh, does that mean that 
most of the companies you will approach are almost legacy companies if you talk for branded entertainment. That's a good question and I haven't really thought that through. Uh, I think yes and no. Okay, so I think in newer categories, while there are probably two forces at play moving in opposite directions. On one hand, you're right, because let's say all these newly funded crypto companies which are advertising on IPL, I'm taking them as an example. For them, it also makes sense. I think you have two things in parallel. One, you've got the ads, which we are doing some of in Bang Bang. On the other hand, there's also an opportunity over here to um, have content that really shifts perception completely in the manner that, again, I use the Queen's Gambit example because for lack of a better local example, I know there are some, but uh, which have completely shifted perceptions on a particular subject. I mean, here was uh, a, third, a book that was written 37 years ago. Suddenly you've made this and made chess sexy and everyone's talking about it. Let's take King Richard, for example. Um, which is, and for some reason, a lot of people, and I don't blame them, still think it's a Shakespearean story. It's the story of the father of Venus and Serena Williams, played by Will Smith. We watched it about a month ago or two months ago, and suddenly none of us in the family, the kids hadn't played tennis for two years. I hadn't played for 25 years. My wife Tara hadn't played for a few years. So we suddenly were all playing twice a week now, thanks to that. So stuff like this can really, really have a strong effect. Now, if we had watched an ad about it, would that have had the effect? I don't think so. So I think that it's for certain categories, it's at two levels. For other categories, you've already done that short term or your audience may not even be able to respond to the short term incentives or short term, uh, let's say, marketing efforts uh, because they're just not consuming that kind of media. So it's going to be a, a mix depending on the category is yeah. my, my thing. So we're discussing something which would have thought one would have thought is a simple business, which is production and so on. Now, obviously, it's getting a lot more complex than, than where you started off in 2010, 2011, whatever it was. Now, tell me, are the skill sets that you need in your company different from what they were 10 years ago? The kind of people, for example, their ability to understand consumer insights or their ability to understand measurement, whatever kind of metrics. I, I would say on the production front, perhaps not so much. And also, I'm... You know, on the business side, I on guess. On the business side, yes. Because we've actually, what's happened is that we started with Bang Bang. Then we built up Jack in the Box and we had the early success of the Colaveri phenomenon essentially, which till today is still the most viewed Indian video of all time without a single rupee spent behind it. Um, and that put us on the map. And then from there we went into content marketing. Then we built the 120 Media Collective as a, as a group and had everything under it. More recently, two years ago, I spun off Bang Bang from 120. So 120 is our agency operations there, of course. I think Bang Bang as a production company is still a production company, although the skill set in terms of understanding technological impact of, um, you know, stuff like Unreal Engine and how to use LED in certain situations, all of that highly specialized uh, stuff is very relevant. But the filmmaking principles, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll come to that in a moment, but I think on, on the agency side of the business, business impact is way more important than it ever used to be, especially because, you know, we position ourselves and you have to keep differentiating, right? I mean, you can't just be a social media agency that died about five years ago if you want to be successful in this business. So we really, and you can do this a lot more with, um, the good news is that smaller companies in structure happen to have money these days as compared to several years ago, right? So you're able to be in the room with two decision makers who actually have, you know, the money to spend and actually have direct impact on their business because there aren't 10 layers, which is very different from 10 years ago when you're working with, not to take away from the large companies of the world, but we work with, you know, some of the largest advertisers, legacy ones, as well as some of these sort of PEVC funded startups, right? And so the effect you're able to have over there, therefore you become almost more like business consultants and strategy forms a big part of it, right? And Jack in the Box, I think we've never been um, an agency that was known for, uh, perhaps actually that's not true, we've had some very creative campaigns, but at the core of it, our real core product has always been the strategy. Um, so I think there, strategic thinking, business focus is way more relevant. On the production side, you know, what has become relevant is to have two, you know, the, the flexibility uh, to move back and forth between a grand, larger sort of bells and whistles type production 
to something which is sort of leaner and needs to be done quicker. So that's an important skill set. Right. So I'm going to end with this. You see, it, there's one part of the business which is your Bang Bang Films where it's fundamentally somebody's idea, somebody's script sold to a client. They come to you for you to add value. I'm not uh, negating that. It's not as if you just want to, you want an interpretation of the script and so on and so forth. To another where you're being a creative source yourself, which is the branded entertainment, where you say it will be our idea. Now, these are two contradictory skill sets required, no? Yeah. For the sake of absurd argument, you might want to hire a Balki or a Piyush or something like that for number two business, but not for number one business. So, right. what happens then? It's almost schizophrenic in the way oh, you have it is, to... which is why we separated the businesses. Right. Um, so, in 120, uh, I actually am um, not really involved in the day-to-day -day running of the business, but... I think that's less relevant. We were one company at until a couple of years ago. And, you know, I think uh, we live in an era where you can be the three C's to someone. The relationship between two parties can be that of client, competitor uh, and collaborator. Right. So um, and, and that happened in parallel. You know, we'd be I remember that very often it happened. We'd be shooting with say Ogilvy or Lowe on a certain day in Bang Bang, whereas we'd be competing against them uh, in a pitch in Jack in the Box. Um, and that happens, you know. So that's the way it is, I guess. Fantastic. And uh, the delightful conversation because, you know, last few uh, interviews, we've been trying to understand where this business is so that we get a, get a better sense of understanding where it will go. Right. Earlier, things didn't change at the pace they're changing. And we could have this conversation once every two, three years because yeah. it was fairly slow. So now I think we need to have another conversation in six months from now. Absolutely. Would love to. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. And that was Rupak Saluja sharing how production in advertising has changed over the years. With that, it's a wrap on this episode of Melt. You can follow us on social media. Our handle is ready to melt and stay updated with all that's happening in the world of advertising and marketing with our daily Melt update on our website, readytomelt.com. Goodbye. <laughs>